Praise the Lord. Well, thankful that you've come tonight. We have just a few minutes this evening. And you know, one word that comes to me in my prayer life a lot is that the word tabernacle. Of course, that is a word used in the Old Testament, the tabernacle of Moses in the wilderness. But the word tabernacle just, you know, it says that Jesus came and dwelled among us. And that word dwelled, tabernacled among us in the body that the Father had provided for him. And we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So in other words, his body was called the tabernacle of the Lord, in which he tabernacled. Tabernacle means moves around him. And uh, if I can start with you tonight in Psalm 84. Well, it's a phenomenal psalm. I love that psalm. 84. And it's a psalm of the sons of Korah. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young, even your altars. O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. In other words, the sparrow and the swallow are nesting in your altars. They have found a home for themselves. Blessed are all those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. It's an interesting way of thinking. You know, Abraham believed that his journey on earth was a pilgrimage. He was just passing through on his way to his heavenly home. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. He is metaphorically speaking, and that has all many meanings that I feel not to go too deep in tonight. And they go from strength to strength, even one. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. O God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. In other words, I'd rather live one day in the presence of the Lord than to live a thousand years or a thousand days. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. (coughs) O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. One day in your courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorman in the house of my God than to sit at ease in the tents of those who don't fear the Lord. You know, sometimes people are maybe looked at in a bit of a uh, disdaining, it's maybe the gentlest way to say it, mocking, disdaining way when they stand at the door greeting people or so, you know, kind of like, (laughs) yeah, look at them standing there, you know, and people walk by. And he says, I'd rather stand at the door of the house of God than to sit in the richest places. And there's something that comes along with people that love to be part of the house of God. There's just something about it. I've seen it in my lifetime, and I haven't lived that long yet, but I've seen it in my lifetime, people that just stay faithful to God, and people that keep loving God. And they show their love for God by their love for his house and their love for his church. And there's something about those people. And I've seen how God begins to work in their families 
and how God begins to work in consecutive generations. I, I met somebody recently and I felt such a depth inheritance within that person. And I said, were your parents Christians? No, no. Were your grandparents Christians? Oh, yeah. And you could see how even though his parents hadn't feared the Lord, his grandparents' reward was in him. And he was carrying this spiritual inheritance that he himself was unaware of, how rich it was, how deep it was, how wide, how long, how high. There was such a spiritual depth to it that nobody who is an immature Christian can have. It takes years to develop these great depths in God and these great surrenders, these great submissions, these great appreciations of God's word and God's spirit and, and the wisdom how to connect with it and how to interpret it within you. It takes years to develop that. And the, his grandparents had developed that over all these years. And he was carrying that. He was carrying this treasure. And here the psalmist is teaching us how lovely it is. Your tabernacle, Lord of hosts. The tabernacle is the dwelling place of the Lord. And how much I love that. Go with me to David's Psalm 63, which is a famous psalm. Most of us know it. Your loving kindness is better than life is there. And he says the same thing. Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. You know, there's something about the prophets of old that it's, if you read the Old Testament, it says rising early, rising early, rising early. They were people that believed that the day should start with God. They had that deep commitment that the day belongs to the Lord. And so they always dedicated that day to the Lord by giving themselves to Him in the breaking of the day. <laughs> if you, for example, uh, read Ian Bounds' book, Edward McKendry Bounds' book, uh, Power Through Prayer, it, that whole uh, 20 chapters, 50 pages, it's extremely rich. So I personally find it easier to listen to it, narrate it, because I can listen to it again and again and again, narrate it. But, you know, and all of these men of God that he's there showing, he's showing their prayer lives. <laughs> and how many of the great men of the past who were very studious, who were very intelligent, lamented themselves as they got older that they spent more time in the, in the study than in the prayer closet. They lamented themselves because they felt that they had missed the sacred part of their devotion, which was fellowship with the Heavenly Father. <laughs> and every life comes to a place where, where you eventually, your appetites for the things of this world become less. And it's just part of getting old. And then what you have spiritually will speak within you and there will be contentment, and there will be rest, and there will be goodness, or there will be emptiness and barrenness, and, and, and complaining. One older man who was taking care of his older father was complaining to me as a pastor that his father was quite immoral in his behavior. And I said, he doesn't know any different. That's all he has left in him, in his conscious. I said, what will you have in your conscious when you are his age? Which in, in his situation is only 25 years away, which is not very long. And if you want to develop certain treasures, it takes time. It takes time to develop certain treasures. And if it's not within you to treasure things, you will not treasure it. It's just not there. It doesn't exist inside of you. But if your heart has been cultured on pilgrimage, that you always, your heart, no matter what busyness of life you have, you, you, in your heart you go back to the Lord. You go back to communion with Him. You go back to prayer with Him. You maybe, as you get older, wake up in the night because you've got to go to the toilet. As you get older, those things can happen. And, and instead of you being bothered by it, you love it because you talk to the Lord. And, and you have that moment of communication before you lay back down and fall back asleep. And, and you actually enjoy 
that the Lord has control over you in your night's sleep. And when you wake up, there is this inner devotion. And I want to talk to you tonight about living in the tabernacle of the Most High. How lovely is it to be in your tabernacle, Psalm 84. David says, my heart thirsts for it. My soul thirsts for it. My flesh longs for it. While I am here on earth, it's like I'm in a dry and thirsty land where there's no water. So I've looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. <laughs> my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul, listen closely, my soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. What does that mean, marrow and fatness? Marrow and fatness speaks about richness. If you take the, the bone and you, you cook it, you get the richness of the marrow which they used to make bouillon, uh, uh, to make uh, rich soup out of it. And the richness is in the marrow of the bone. So he's talking about how his bones were rich with God's presence. He could feel the fire of God in his bones. He could feel the presence of God in his bones. His bones were not just cold and empty and old and brittle and, and gone dry. You know, that is naturally true. <laughs> that if we don't allow ourselves to be constantly filled with the Holy Spirit, we can become dry inside. Literally, physically dry. What enriches you is the Spirit of the living God. And that, he says, it causes me to want to praise you with joyful lips when I remember you on my bed and meditate on you in the night watches. Because you've been my help, therefore in the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand holds me up. I shall be satisfied. So all these things talk about what the life is like for those who dwell in the tabernacle of God. That is what that is like because David and Korah and these others were given shadows and types of what the Heavenly Father now gives us through Jesus Christ in His presence. And God wants us to live in His tabernacle. If I could take you to Hebrews chapter 9, please. Hebrews chapter 9. Wow, when you begin to see this. And you know, it is very clear to see those that live in the tabernacle of God and those that don't. Why? There's a satisfaction about their lives that carries them in times of agony, in times of loneliness and emptiness. People that don't have that kind of communion with the Heavenly Father, they develop patterns that are not always healthy when they suffer with loneliness or they suffer with pain and conflict in life because they don't know how to go into that hiding place. They don't know where to refuge. They don't know what to do with them, their own emotions, their own feelings. They don't know where to go with, with the disappointments of life. They don't know what to do with it. And we all have them. And for you to look at some people and go, oh, they have it so much easier, it's not true, folks. There is absolutely no temptation that's not common to all men, the scripture says. And don't think that other people have it easier. We all, at our own turn in life, have our challenges. <laughs> and, and some challenges, psh, my goodness, if I see what some people go through, my inner being shakes. Literally shakes. And, and, and it's so painful to see what some people go through. But then I remember what we went through and how the Lord kept us and upheld us and how we were satisfied in Him and how He showed His glory in our weakness and His all-sufficient grace. And, and that is the tabernacle because look at this. This is, uh, I'll read from the Amplified chapter 9 of Hebrews starting at verse 11. And it will be, never be necessary. Hold on. Chapter... 9, that was chapter 8, thank you, verse 11. 
Thank you, Jesus. But that appointed time came when Christ the Messiah appeared as a high priest of the better things that have come and are to come. Then through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with human hands, that is not a part of this natural creation, he went once and for all into the holiest of holies of heaven, not by virtue of the blood of goats and calves, like the high priest would enter the holies of holies, that was only but a type, which, by which to make reconciliation between God and man, but his own blood, having found, listen closely, he went into the tabernacle of heaven, the holy of holies as it is called, having found and secured a complete redemption, an everlasting release for us. For it is the mere sprinkling of unholy and defiled person with blood of goats and bulls and with the ashes of a burnt heifer sufficient for the purification of the body. How much more surely shall the blood of Christ who by virtue of his eternal spirit, his own pre-existing divine personality, offered himself an unblemished sacrifice to God, purify our conscience from dead works and lifeless observances to serve the living God. So Jesus, with his own blood, went into the tabernacle of God to secure for us to secure for us eternal redemption, eternal release. And the reason I bring that up, what's it like to be in the tabernacle of God? What's it like to live in that communion with him? What is it like to live in that fellowship? It's unimaginable to think that people are Christians for many years and don't know it. They don't know how to get there. They don't know how to live there. They don't know what to do. And when they're up against the wall, then many times I feel like calling anybody and everybody <coughs> because they don't know how to get there themselves. And I know I've been there <coughs> in 1989 or so, uh, uh, maybe a little later. I can't remember now, but anyway, it was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, my son, Zachary, who was very young, maybe four years old. Oh, what a lovely little fella he was. And he was very ill and he had very high fever. And we had gone to the doctor, uh, you know, the GP, and he said, oh, it will go away. You know, you just need to keep him at home, he, you know, go away. But it got worse. And I, and I was downstairs studying while he was laying next to his mom on the bed. And suddenly while I'm studying there, this, this agony of what he was going through came upon me. And I went upstairs and I I turned on the hallway light and it shone into the bedroom and it just shone on his little face and it was radiant with that light. And and his eyes were wide open and his pupils were dilated, but he was asleep. And I put my hand on his head and it was so hot, (coughs) so hot. So in other words, I realized how serious it is. You know, so many times we can be facing the most serious situation, but there's no movement in us. And, and not everybody likes the movement. I don't, still don't find it easy. I still find it terribly painful. It can, to me, feel like my insights are being pulled out of me. It can be so painful. And I can feel the bum, 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 bum of the situation, the battle of it. And, <clears throat> and I walk downstairs and, and I walk back and forth and back and forth. I said, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And I just couldn't connect. I couldn't connect. I couldn't come into the tabernacle. I couldn't find my way in. I couldn't come in. I couldn't come in. I just, I couldn't get in. I didn't know how to get in. I, I, it was, Jesus is the way. He says, I'm the way. No one comes to the Father except by me. And, and we know the way. Jesus is the way. And, and we have Jesus, so we have the way. So I am calling on the name of Jesus, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord. So I'm doing it, and I couldn't get in. I couldn't get in. And I called my father. And, uh, 
uh, in the Netherlands, and I, he always worked till deep in the night. And I called my dad. It was prob probably about one o'clock in the morning, and I said, "Hey, pa." Uh, I said, Zachary is very ill, and we took him to the doctor, but he said it would be okay, but the fever is so high, and I don't know what to do that. And he said, let's pray. I love this, you know. My, my father, he, he was smart enough not to talk too much. And not all the answers always come through talk. It doesn't mean we shouldn't talk, but there's a time to talk, and there's a time to pray. And, and so he said, let's pray. And he said, thank you, Jesus, that you're always with us, and that by your stripes, Zachary is healed. Amen. He said, so well now. It's all well now, right? That was it. That was the prayer. And he said, okay, it's all well now. In other words, goodbye. <laughs> so I hung up the phone. And I am still feeling just as miserable. I'm feeling the same battle. And I'm walking back and forth. Thank you, Jesus, that you're always with us. And by your stripes, I grace you. Thank you. You see, when you're handed a key to get in, use it. And that is sometimes our misnomer. We're handed keys, but we don't use them. I was handed the key. So I'm praying. I'm using the key. Thank you, Jesus, that you're always with us. And by your stripes, I can seal. Thank you, Jesus. And only one hour. And I know that sounds long for some people, but that's not long when you're talking about victory. Within one hour, pop. Oh, I felt it. Woo, glory to God. I'm in. I'm in the tabernacle where nothing is impossible where all things are under the authority of the Almighty, where He is in control. Oh, I felt that presence. I'm in. Glory to God. I walked upstairs. I turned on the hallway light, and it shone on His face, and His eyes were closed, and He was drenched in sweat, and the fever had broken, and the battle was won. We have to learn how to get in and see as you... As you Practice entering. Come on, with boldness, Hebrews chapter 10 says, let us enter in through the new and life-giving way which Christ has inaugurated through his flesh with a true heart and sincere faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us enter in with boldness. Boldness means I have here, I have this key. Right? That's to my house. And I'm going to go home tonight after the meeting and I put that key in the door, open the door, and I walk in and, oi, and she knows that's me. Right? Now that's called boldness. You go ahead and try it. You try to walk into my house like that. Yeah, my, my wife may come down with a baseball bat and say, who are you? <laughs> no. But you understand, I have... Boldness means access, confidence. I have this, I, I don't have to pray for it. I don't have to ask for it. I just do, I just go in. And that's what God wants us to develop. And there is eternal redemption in his presence. In other words, there's a continual washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit that as you enter, as you enter, you feel accepted, you feel well-pleasing, you feel free of condemnation, you feel free of guilt, you feel, oh, this, this, this is where I can be addressed. This is where I'm free from all the madness that I don't know how to cope with. This is where I can think clear. This is where I know what to believe. This is where I know what to pray. This is where I know how to just stand and wait to see my Father act on behalf of those who love Him and fear Him. Oh, this is my dwelling place. This is my secret place. This is my refuge. This is my habitation. These are all scriptures you can find, Psalm 91 and so many other places. And that's the tabernacle of God. That's the tabernacle of God. And God wants you to know how to get in there through the new life given way, through that precious blood. Because as you begin to enter consistently into that place, you will begin to realize the, how powerful the blood is to remove those agonizing, frustrating accusations out of your conscience. 
these memories of past things, these, these thoughts of inferiority, these thoughts of unworthiness, these thoughts of I'm not good enough, I didn't walk it, these accusations of the devil that are often familiar to your culture, to your home, to your family, to your history, and they disappear. They, you don't even know them anymore. And you could be with other family members who still walk under these ways of cultural thinking and you don't have it. You don't have it. And, and they're going to sometimes feel uncomfortable about you because you have a freedom they don't know. You have a, a peace they don't know. You have a goodness you don't know. they don't know. And that is you are embodying the tabernacle of the Most High. So a couple of scriptures before I close. <laughs> a couple of scriptures uh, before I close. Uh, John 14. John 14. Uh, folks, if I didn't know how to live in the tabernacle of God, I couldn't cope with life. I really couldn't. And the devil would have won already and talked me uh, out of continuing as pastor. He would have talked me into giving up. And when he tried real hard to talk me into giving up, he couldn't succeed because I knew where to run from that, from that dark voice, from that dark feeling. I knew where to get away from it. You see, many times people don't know how to get away from their challenges because they don't know how to get into the tabernacle and to the presence of the Most High. Jesus said, a little while longer, John 14, verse 19, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live you will live also. At that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. At that day you will know. You see, the tabernacle, people don't always understand, is where Jesus is living and the life that he lives in the tabernacle is what he gives to live inside of you. In Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 3, so Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence of rejoicing of hope firm to the end, we are his house. <laughs> Did you know that? We are the living stones built into a spiritual house to bring sacrifices that are well pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. One more verse. It's 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. No, verse 15. He says, if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. We, as his body, are that tabernacle. That is what makes church, church. Everything else, folks, amen. I love singing. I, I love all the other things, and it's part of it. But it's not what makes the church. What makes the church is the Lord himself indwelling us and us in him and him in us. And what makes us powerful as a church is not that we have money in the bank. It's helpful. It's helpful. But it doesn't make you powerful. It doesn't mean you have your own building and you have your own this and this and that. So many people think when we get our building, then we'll become a powerful church. No, it's not what makes you powerful. It's the Lord himself. He is the power of the church. His indwelling life, spirit, power. And that power needs to be seen. And this is what I pray that we may all begin to cry for and hunger for and thirst for in that eternal redemption that he obtained for us. I mean, I find it unbearable, but it's just, that way that I've seen people come to church and, and they insist to continue in their sins. And, and I find it unbearable. And I cry to the Lord, Lord, if you don't wash us, if you don't make us new, 
I can't bear it, Lord. I believe personally that the church is to be like a big Holy Ghost washing machine. And you come and you get washed, you get washed, and, and you lose the consciousness of these sinful desires and sinful ways, and you gain the consciousness of holy desires and holy ways, and you become made new inwardly. The Bible says we are saved by the washing of being made new inwardly through the Holy Spirit in Titus 3. And that there is that redeeming work as a church. You know, we have... One person, uh, I met this lady and, <clears throat> and, um, and her and her husband were ministers and she said to me, my daughter is living with another woman and I keep praying for her and praying for her. I said, okay, I'll start praying for her too and maybe next time you see her, ask her to come to Life Church and come and see me. Well, anyway, one Sunday morning, she had arrived in town late. She lived somewhere else and walked in through that door. And I was standing up here preaching. And Jesus took a hold of her and instantly set her free. And I asked her later, I said, what was this? I don't understand that way of living. So what was it? She said, oh, I get this most overwhelming, consuming desire to be with this individual. But this individual was not a woman. <laughs> And she said, when I walked in, something, something came to me and the desire was gone. And I couldn't bear the thought of having to go back to it anymore. And, and this precious lady, she's married and loving the Lord and serving the Lord. But that is the eternal redemption that Jesus obtained for us. That is what makes the church powerful. And you would want that for your church. You would want people to come here and get set free from things that are against God's plans and purposes for their lives. And that they could see His will come to pass for their lives. And see His purposes come to pass for their lives. And I know what this is like. But my goodness, we've got to have more of it, or at least I do. One young man, 23-year-old, I was visiting his mom and dad. They went to the kitchen to make lunch, and he sat down next to me on the sofa. He said, Pastor, I'm suffering, I'm suffering. Can you help me? I said, what are you suffering with? He said, I'm so addicted to pornography, and I keep praying and looking up scriptures, but I can't shake it. I can't shake it. Every night I sit there for hours on my computer. What am I to do? What am I to do? And I felt Jesus, whoop, come up in me like a fountain, and I put my arm around him, and I said, Father, I thank you that you love him and that you're always with him. Amen. And I felt content. What contentment? His tabernacle. I'm in his presence. He's in control. He's in control. He's in control. And doesn't mean everybody reacts with it. yoo -hoo, how wonderful. Some people can get really angry if God shows up. Well, they can get upset. Oh my, have I ever experienced that? But he was set free. He wrote me an email a couple of months later and he said, I don't know what happened, but it left me. You see, that is the eternal redemption Jesus obtained for us, that he is sitting on that throne of redemption, of reconciliation, of restoration. We have to live in that. We have to know how to get there. Come on now, you have to practice how to get there daily, daily. Get out of your bed in the morning and spend some time in the tabernacle of the Most High. Spend some time in communion with Him and fellowship. You say, I don't know what it's like. You've got to start somewhere. You've got to just get up and say, Lord, I'm here. I used to do it at night. I used to pray all the way in, until 2 o'clock in the morning and so forth. And then I got married and Virginia looked at me one time and she says, I always have to go to sleep alone. I said, wow, well, we could change that. Sure. You know, and, and, and I said, I'll do it. I'll just get up in the morning. I set my clock for 4.30. I got my Bible, my notepad and my red pen and I kneeled in front of the sofa and woke up at 7.30. <laughs> as I always woke up at 7.30. And I thought, my goodness, Lord, what have I got to do? And don't be somebody who says, oh, I'm just not a morning person. Oh, stop being so carnal. No, I, I just said, Lord, help me. I can't do it. Help me. And he gave me this idea to stand before him like this for 10 minutes. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for your anointing and power over me. And I do that for 10 minutes. And I only had to do that for about two years, and that was it. <laughs> no, seriously, that was it. And now I never need a clock in the morning. The Holy Spirit's got that kind of control. 
Come on now, folks. You, you are controlled by whatever you submit yourself to. That is just a fact of life. And you can, you can say to anybody, and people can be fooled by you, but God can't. You've got to learn how to gain access into that tabernacle of the Most High. You've got to learn how to feed on that redemption for your own soul, for your own conscience. I tell you, I need it. And when something that I happened by accident or so see on television that just poof, bit me and I feel the poison of it trying to get into my system, oh my goodness, I, how I go into the Lord right away. And I have to sometimes stay there for a day and a half before that poison is overcome by that redeeming power. I cannot bear having these things in my conscience and, and, and roaming around in there and, and finding its way out in my thinking or talking, God forbid. Uh, and I used to get so frightened by it. Uh, if I saw something <clears throat> that would defile me, I would get so frightened and I would think, oh, please, Lord, please, Lord. But now I just have more confidence that that redeeming power is in the tabernacle. I mean, come on now. If you were walking down the road and there was a puddle you didn't see and some car came by and psh, bang, and you were baptized in mud, you're not going to go, oh, Jesus, my life is over. <laughs> no, you go home and take a shower. Say amen. amen. Well, take a Holy Ghost shower every day. Come into that Holy of Holies. Oh, into the most holy place and be showered by that fountain that never runs dry that Christ has opened up through his blood. Oh, there's a fountain filled with blood flowing from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. And you just stand there worshiping in that Holy of Holies and all of a sudden a day or so or a couple of hours later, the consciousness of that defilement is gone, the upsetness is gone, the hurt is gone, and goodness begins to flow again out of the Holy of Holies through your life, and people in the house can feel it. I couldn't fu function without it. Now, God wants you to have this. He needs you to have it. If you don't get it, some of us, we would have such emotional issues. We'd get so emotionally screwed up. <laughs> And dysfunctional because it's all too heavy, it's too hard, too painful. You've got to get healed in that Holy of Holies, in that tabernacle of the Most High. You've got to get healed. Some people are not going to change right away, but you can. Some circumstances are not going to go away right away, but you can live in victory over it, in authority over it, in power over it. I've had to live with some trials for many, many years. And the Lord just kept me living happy in his presence. He kept me, upheld me, steadied me. And it didn't harm my marriage. It didn't harm my home. It didn't harm my children. And then the Lord brought the breakthrough over time. And to him be the praise and the glory. You got to know how to live in the tabernacle. Have the refuge. Have your hiding place. And walk in that kind of anointing. Can you hear me? I'm very serious. I want you to learn how to get there, like that, bum. Why? Because you go there all the time. You, you'd stand in a meeting and you could be standing next to a smelly person or whatever, and you just, whew, and you're in the holy place with God. And you feel the fragrance of his blessing, give you such authority and blessing. Father, you invite us into this tabernacle where you have secured eternal redemption for us eternal freedom, eternal washing and cleansing in your blood from all the filthiness of the flesh and spirit and the things of this world that defile us, from familiar mindsets that oppress us. You've brought us into a place where there's a refuge, where there's help, where we can minister out of that tabernacle the gifts and graces of your great love to our own household, to our own family, even to those who hate us and curse us. And I thank you, Father, that you are teaching us how to live there and that we can all have that boldness to enter in through the new and life-giving way that you've opened for us through Jesus. I believe right now, Heavenly Father, that we all feel compelled that we say, Father, I used to be so familiar here. I used to feel so at home here, but I haven't been here for so long. 
I've become so idle and indifferent, Lord. I've been distracted and I've become lukewarm. I don't know how to come back. But here I am, Lord. I want to come back. I want to come back. I want to come back. I want to know again that wonderful intimacy where your love is in control of my heart and mind and guides me in my ways of living. Oh, Lord, I want to come back. I want to come back. I don't want to be outside anymore. I want to be inside. I want to be part of your house. I want to be part of your intimate family. I want to come back, Lord. Here I am, Lord. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Psalm 119 says, when I realized the wrong direction I was, was headed, I turned around and came running back. Lord, we're coming back into that wonderful intimacy. And I praise you that you give us keys. You give us ways to get back in when we don't know how to get there. Thank you for your Holy Spirit's life over each and every one of us. And anybody right now that needs healing in their body, then I'll lay your hand on your heart, maybe, or your belly. And Lord Jesus, I thank you for miracles in people's bodies. I thank you the sickness and disease is being arrested by your spirit and power. And the symptoms are leaving. And all the harassment of illness is leaving. Thank you, Jesus, for the miracles in our bodies. Thank you, Lord, that while we sit here in church, hearing your life-giving word, you're healing us emotionally, mentally, physically, financially, in every way. You bring restoration and wholeness and well-being to us. In Jesus' name I pray and everybody says amen. I know I've gone over a bit. Have a good night's sleep. I look forward to see you on Sunday if you can make a day. Thanks for coming, everybody.